we go.
Lord God in heaven, we praise you and thank you so much that you give us a brand new heart when we get saved. I thank you that you took that old heart of stone of mine out and you replaced it with a heart of flesh that would be prone to follow you, to seek after you with all of our heart, all my heart. And then, Lord, I pray for those who are in their homes and watching this evening. I want to pray that as you've given them a new heart, God, that the heart of belief might be in them. And if there be some who are sitting around, maybe in the living room or someplace, and God, they're watching this message and you've never given them a new heart, I want to pray that you would quicken their souls. I want to pray that you would place a new heart inside of them today. Give them belief so that they can truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died on the cross, that He was placed in a tomb, He rose from the grave, and He now sits at your right hand, God, where He intercedes for us. And I pray that eyes might be given that will be able to see and ears might hear the word and that hearts might truly be transformed into believing saints who follow after you. Lord, I pray that you would bless our time together this evening. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Well, hello there. It's good to see you again. I've gotten to see many of you as you've come by the office the last few days or the last couple of weeks. It's been a joy of mine to get to go and carry on conversations with each one of you, talk to some of you by the telephone, talk with many of you through text messages and whatnot. So thank you for staying connected with us. Once again, we'll be in Romans tonight, and we're going to pick up, and uh, the focal passage is going to come from Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. Now, I know if you were here tonight, I'd probably say something like this. For those of you who brought your Bible with you, would you please hold it up tonight? And then I'll ask you, how long do you hold that Bible up? And you'll know I'll come back and say, until I can see who forgot to bring theirs. So hold your Bible up now so I can see who's got theirs. And for those of you who don't have your Bible, would you please run and pick it up and bring it so that you can sit down and look at the text tonight because it actually makes a difference. The Word of God is living and it's active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword and it changes who we are. When we read it, it penetrates deep into our souls. And I hope that that'll be the case with you tonight. Well, we're continuing that study in the book of Romans. As we study in the book of Romans, the, the passage actually comes from chapters 9 and 10. So we're going to back up and pick up one verse of Scripture in chapter 9 before we get along too far. But we're actually going to focus on what it says in verses 5 through 15 in chapter 5. Now, in Romans chapter 10, verses 5, 15, we see an explanation. And that's an explanation of salvation in the heart of someone who has been justified before God. Now, no one can get into heaven unless they have some justification for why they should be able to get into heaven. Now, by the grace of God, a person believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who has raised from the grave and right now He sits at the right hand of God the Father and He is King of the kingdom of heaven and one day that kingdom of heaven will come down to earth. In the meantime, we bow down to Him. We bend our knee to Him. We know that He has all authority over us. And He tells us what to do because He loves us. He always tells us the right thing to do and that thing that is best for us and is good for His kingdom at the same time. So that's where we're going to jump in tonight. Now, if I had to have a summary statement for tonight, I had to sum the whole message up in one sentence, this is what it would look like. A person is justified before God when their heart believes unto righteousness. Now, it's not just enough to simply believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. We actually have to have a heart that believes so much that it changes our convictions on the way that we live our lives. That heart is a gift that comes from God. He places it inside each and every one of us. You see, in every soul, in every person on planet earth, 
There is a longing to stand before Almighty God at the end of our days and be able to justify why He should allow us into heaven and why He should not cast us into the lake of fire where there be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, if, if many of you who have read your Bible through will remember in the Old Testament there's a book called the book of Job. Now, in the book of Job, you remember that Job wanted to have an audience before God. He felt like things had not been going exactly like he thought they should. So he says these words in chapter 13, verse 3 of Job, where it says, But I would, but I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to argue my case with God. Do you know that every person one day will stand up and argue their case with God. Those who have justification will pass through the judgment into heaven where there will be a new heaven and new earth come down and everything will be made as it should be. And then those who are not going to pass through the judgment will stop at the judgment and they'll start to give an account of their life. They'll try to find some justification for the things that they've done that would sway God to let him, them, into heaven. Only there won't be any because the only justification that there is is the fact that the person believes in their heart that Jesus Christ, who was crucified on the cross and died, was placed in a tomb, that He rose from the grave, and that He now sits at the right hand of the Father where He is our Lord Jesus Christ, which is what the text is going to say in a few minutes. Now, there is a God-made place in the heart of every human being. It's, just, it's a spot that God has in there. And people are looking for something that they can fill that, hot, that, that spot with. If you, if you want to think of it this way, there's an emptiness. There's an empty spot. There's, an em, there's, a, there's a, got a shape to it, but there's this spot inside of every person that's empty. So they go around looking for something that they can find to fill that spot up. Now, some people will go and they'll, they'll look for love. If I could just find the right person to love me, then my life would be complete. Then the next person comes along and says, Well, man, I believe sexuality. If we could just explore our sexuality, it would satisfy us. We would be filled up and we would be happy. Maybe another person comes along and says, Man, I know there is some kind of drug out there that I can take that will make everything okay. Or maybe a person is feeling empty on the inside, so what they do is they turn to alcohol, they open the bottle, they pop the top on the beer, they begin to drink to try to kill that emptiness that they have on the inside. Maybe, maybe, maybe perhaps they're going to go and look for pornography and try to find things on the internet that will satisfy this desire that they have inside them. And it could even be that some people eat just simply trying to satisfy that empty spot that's inside of them. Some people are seeking to fill it with power. Some people are seeking to fill it with success. But you know what? None of that stuff will fill that hole that's in the side, inside of a person. That hole inside of a person comes in the shape of Jesus Christ. And the only thing that will actually fit inside that hole is Jesus himself or the spirit of Jesus, as the book of Acts calls it. You see, we, it's just like a, a, a round hole in a square peg. You keep trying to fit things in there that won't go. Well, God made every person with this longing and desire in them, and it's Jesus Christ that fills that spot. And that takes place inside of our heart. Paul is going to teach in this message in just a moment, in this section we're going to read, that you don't have to go up to heaven to be able to see Jesus to know that He exists. He's going to teach in this passage that you don't have to go down into the abyss, that you don't have to go down to hell. You don't have to go into the grave and see that Jesus Christ is rising from the grave. But when a person has faith in Jesus Christ, they believe because they heard that Jesus had risen from the grave and sits at the right hand of the Father, and they believe. And when they believe, they have a new heart inside of them, and that new heart has a new conviction with it that didn't have before they had that particular heart. 
By the way, I was reading in my own personal time this morning, and I love to read the Word of God. Uh, my family will tell you the first thing I do every morning is I wake up and, and I get to my office as soon as I can. And when I get in my office, I open the Word of God, and I read anywhere from four to ten chapters of the Bible and then, and then write out my prayers to God because I seem to do better when I write those things out. But this morning as I opened up the text and I was reading through, I was in the book of Ezekiel and I was just about to get to Ezekiel chapter 7 where, where the, dry, the valley of the dry bones, where everything comes together. And I realized that right in front of that, right before the resurrection of those bodies, right before the resurrection, if you will, of a person's soul, the text starts talking about God giving us a new heart. You see that longing that we have inside of us? God fills that longing with a new heart of flesh. He says our old heart was made out of stone, but he comes inside of us and takes that heart out and puts it back in here. And I think if you'll think in those terms, when we're reading the text and we're talking about the text, it will make a lot more sense to you this evening. So having said all that, let's jump in there to Romans chapter 10. But before I read chapter 10 verse 5, would you flip back about a page and look at Romans chapter 9, verse 33. 9, verse 33, because this is going to come back, and it's really important that we remember this, because Paul is he's, he's writing a letter. Remember, there weren't chapter breaks there then. So these kind of things are glued together, and it's important when we understand and get that. So as we look at that, look at verse uh, chapter 9, verse 33, where it says, As it is, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Now I'm going to let you know that the New Testament is going to let you understand that that stone, that rock, is talking about is going to be Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. So let's pick up in verse 5 now in chapter 10. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. You remember in the Old Testament they were trying to be righteous and the way to be righteous was by living by the law? He goes on and he says, that person who does the commandments shall live by them. So they were trying to live by the law to be righteous. But look at verse, uh, as it continues on, in, in verse 6 it says, but the righteous based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? And who, uh, uh, do not say in your heart, who will ascend to heaven? That is to bring Christ down from heaven. Or who will descend down into the abyss? That is to bring Jesus Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth. Now you may want to circle that word mouth because you're going to see that used a lot in these, in these verses. The word is near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your, and I want you to underline or circle the word heart right there. Very important to see the mouth and the heart because you can't separate the mouth and the heart when it comes to salvation. And it goes on and it says that is the word of faith that was proclaimed. So because of faith, the heart is going to be changed and the mouth is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. That's what he's going to say in a minute. Verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that everybody at home, would you read the next three words with me? If you would confess that Jesus is Lord, thank you very much, and believe in your, what's that word? That's right, heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be, what? Saved. Now what does that save mean? He saves means we're going to be saved from the fires of hell. It means we're going to be saved from the penalty of our sins. It means that we're going to be saved one day from the presence of our sin. It means that today we can be saved from the pull, from, 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 from the pull of that sin. And one day... We'll, we'll stand in glory completely justified. Going on, it says in verse 10, for, what the heart, well, for with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, you see the heart and the mouth again connected together, with the, the, with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So the heart and the mouth 
have to be in sync with each other for salvation to take place. You can't just confess with your mouth. You have to believe in your heart. And you can't just believe in your heart. You have to confess with your mouth. So you see these two things are linked together and there's no way we can separate them. Verse 10 goes on to say, For what the heart, for with the heart one believes. Because it's really in your heart whether you believe that Jesus rose from the grave or not. It's with the heart that one believes and is justified, and it's with the mouth that he confesses and is saved. Verse 11, For the Scripture says, Everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. Now the reason they won't be put to shame is they're going to find out in the end this is absolutely true. It is the truth. Verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. So it doesn't matter whether you are in God's chosen family of the Jews or whether you're a non-chosen person. Either, either way, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you're going to be saved. For the same Lord is Lord of all. He's Lord over everything. Okay, He's even, he's even Lord if you don't agree that He's Lord. He's still Lord bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. Now, not on all, but on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, verse 14 then. We start seeing a bunch of hows. You may want to underline all the hows in here because you're going to find five hows in here. How then will they call on Him whom they have not believed? How are they going to believe? How are they going to be able to call on something they don't know? And the next one is, and how are they to believe in Him whom they have not heard? So if they hadn't heard about it, how can they possibly believe in Him? And then he goes on and says, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? In other words, somebody's got to say something about it. And in verse 15 says, and how are they to preach unless they are sent. So somebody has got to be sent to do the preaching. And the scripture goes on and it says, As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And I'll make, I, I, I'll make a guess right here. And I, I, I don't think I'll be wrong, but I'm going to make a guess here. Those of you who know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you probably know who it was who got up off of their seats and got on their feet, and they came and they told you about Jesus Christ. It may have been a Sunday school teacher. It may have been a next door neighbor. It may have been the preacher who was preaching that day. But you heard the gospel and your heart was quick. And you got that new heart that Jeremiah talked about and God placed it inside of you. Well, I'm going to break the text. Let me go ahead and tell you what I'm going to Let me tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'll tell you. And this is what I'm going to tell you. Uh, there's three things we're going to talk about right here. The first one is this. We're going to talk about the stone of Zion. All right, we'll come back to that in just a second, but that's where we're going is the stone of Zion. The second thing we're going to talk about is the confession. Now, what is the confession? The confession is the statement that Jesus is Lord. Okay, we're going to spend a little bit of time on that. And then when we get to the last, it's going to be about the five hows. You remember I pointed out five hows to you. We'll, we'll get there in just a minute. So let's go back to number one right here and let's look at the stone, uh, the stone of Zion. Now, you remember we backed up and picked verse, we picked up in Romans chapter 9, verse 33, where it says, at, As it is written, Behold, I am laying a stone, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. I want you to know that in the Bible, a reference specifically to this stone is found seven times in Scripture. So what I'm going to do over the next couple of minutes is I'm going to flash up on the screen all seven times that this appears in Scripture. Now, it's been my, uh, my conviction that if the Bible tells you something, you need to pay attention to what it says. But it's been a stronger conviction that if God tells you something in the Bible twice, it really matters. It's like when the teacher repeats something, or the teacher tells you something twice, then they write it down a third time, give it to you on a study sheet. You know what's going to happen. That's going to come back on the test later on. Well, I want you to understand that this is the, the stone of Zion appears seven times in Scripture. There's the first one. The, 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 other one I, the next one I want you to look at is found in Psalms 18, verse 22. 
Now, Psalm 18, 22, you can take that, look at it, go up and look it up in Scripture later on, but this is what it says. This is, this is the psalmist writing and letting us know about something that's going to be there in the future. What does it say? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So God's laying the foundation to paint the picture that when Jesus Christ came, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the ruling bodies of the day are going to reject Jesus, but He's going to be the very one who is the cornerstone. He is our rock and our redeemer. And the Bible is full of references to Jesus being the rock. Well, we could go to Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 1, the 40, uh, 42nd verse, Jesus himself is talking about himself. He says, have you never read in the scriptures, and he refers back to the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. This was God. God's the one who did this. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So he's beginning to set up the fact that this stone that's talked about so many times in Scripture is going to be the main thing. So we go from Matthew, we jump over to the book of Mark. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have something referencing this in there. Mark says in chapter 12, verse 10, Have you not read the Scriptures? And then help me with it. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. You start to see how important this stone in Zion actually is? Well, let's flip over and let's look at, uh, let's look at uh, Luke. In, in Luke chapter 20, verse 17, where it says... But he looked directly at them, and this is Jesus who is looking directly at them, and he says these words, What then is this that is written? And okay, here's the words again. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And then if we want to go to 1 Peter, when Peter's writing that letter to the church in 1 Peter, we can get in chapter 2 and look at verses 7 and 8, and he's going to, Peter's going to write these words. He's going to say, So that the honor is for you who believe. Remember, it's with the heart that we believe and are justified. But for those who do not believe, the stone, who is Jesus Christ, that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone of our faith, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. So what turns out that the stone, everybody's got to deal with the stone. Everybody on the face of the earth has to deal with Jesus Christ in some way or another. Maybe I could have gone to the book of Acts and seen, showed you the seventh one here. It's contained in chapter 4, verse 11. He said, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. In fact, when, when, when Peter says that in a sermon he's preaching, he's preaching to the Pharisees, he's preaching to the pre priest, he's preaching to the Sadducees who are listening there. He said, This, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. So first thing we want to take away from all those scriptures is that Jesus is the stone. He is the rock upon which we as Christians are hewn. He is the place we stand, the firm foundation. You remember the, the man who built his house on the stone? Jesus Christ is the stone we build our house on. Over and over, scripture alludes to Jesus Christ as being the stone. But that stone was rejected by men. It was rejected by the Pharisees, the Sadducees. It was rejected by Pilate. It was rejected by Herod. It was rejected by all of those who came to him. But their rejecting it was not a good idea. You see, if I was to take you back to the book of Daniel, you know there's a minor prophet by the name of Daniel. In chapter 2, we see where King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he dreams about this big giant statue, and he and he calls for an interpretation of that dream. And in the interpretation of that dream, Daniel comes up and he, he tells Nebuchadnezzar what he was dreaming about. Nebuchadnezzar never even told him about the dream. Daniel just tells him about the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has had. Nebuchadnezzar is, now that he knows that Daniel knows the dream without him telling him about it, he knows that he must have the interpretation from God. Turns out that there's this big giant statue that's made out of iron and clay and, and different, different parts in different places. And in the dream, there's a place where this big giant stone is hurled at the statue. It's a big giant statue. And the statue is torn to pieces. 
You see, Peter is letting them know that Jesus Christ is that stone that tears down kingdoms. It's that stone that rejects everything in this world because everybody, even King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man on the face of the earth, has to bow his knees to Jesus Christ as Lord. Matthew chapter 21 verse 44 reads this way. And it says, And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush them. Now let me, let, let me help you understand this text right here. And the one who falls on the stone. So he's distinguishing that there's two people. There's one person who comes to the stone, and they fall down on the stone, and they're broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. You see, when we come to the stone, when we come to Jesus Christ and we fall to Him broken, He saves us. But if we come to Jesus Christ and we don't fall down, bend our knee before Him and come, the stone will fall on us and it will pulverize us and it will crush us. What you do with the knowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died on the cross, He was placed in the tomb, and He rose from the grave, has everything in the world to do with your eternal destiny. If you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth, you're going to be saved. If you disbelieve with your heart and you don't confess with your mouth, then you're not going to be saved. Which, which brings me to the confession itself. The confession itself. Now the confession is, this is what everybody has to agree to and say, that Jesus is Lord. Now let me, let me make this clear up front. If you choose not to confess that Jesus is Lord, that doesn't stop Jesus from being Lord. Because the reality is, the truth is the truth, whether you believe the truth is truth or not. As Lord, Jesus has authority over everything. When Jesus ascended up into heaven, He told His disciples, before He went to sit at the right hand of the Father, He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Even Satan himself has to bow to the authority of Jesus Christ as Lord. There will come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You see, Jesus is Lord is not just a statement. It is a life-changing justification before God that will lead to righteousness. Let me say that sentence again. Jesus is Lord is not just a statement that you make with your mouth. It's a life-changing justification. You remember I told you at the beginning of the message, everybody's going to stand before God and there's got to be a justification as to why God lets you into heaven. Well, Jesus Christ... Your confession of Jesus Christ as Lord is going to be what gets you into heaven because Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe that in your heart and you have confessed that with your mouth when you're here on earth so that everybody knows that you believe that Jesus is Lord and that He's sitting at the right hand of the Father and that He has authority over your life. You will be let into heaven. You see, Jesus as Lord is the confession it's a confession statement that flows out of your heart that believes that Jesus actually rose from the grave. Even authority, Jesus has all authority, but He even has authority over everything that you say or do. You see, as a believer, we know Jesus is the master and we are the slaves. Whatever He calls us to do, we know that's what we're supposed to do. Now what happens in this new heart that He gives us, because we believe that, He begins to change who we are and He begins to give us the desires of our heart because the desires of our heart is to please our Father. And that takes place all of our lives so that we start living a righteous life because it's what we desire in our hearts. Not because we have to live a righteous life to get into heaven, but because we have a new heart, we desire to live a righteous life because we have been justified, because Jesus is Lord. See, the confession, Jesus is Lord, leads an individual to willingly bow their knee to Jesus Christ. It's something that they don't mind doing at all. In fact, they want to do the very same thing that Jesus did. 
You see, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 through 11 says this about Jesus. And being found in human form, remember that's God coming down to earth and becoming a man. So being found in the form of a human, he humbled himself, becoming obedient even to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name which means there is no authority over Jesus. He's the ultimate authority. So that at the name of Jesus, now listen to this, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So everybody in heaven will bow to Jesus because He is the Lord. Everybody on earth will bow to Jesus because He is Lord. Now one day heaven will come down to earth and we'll be down here and we'll be, right now they're bowing to Him in heaven. One day on earth we'll bow down to Him. But then listen to the last one. And every knee under the earth. Now where's under the earth? That's going to be in the gates of hell. Even those people who have been cast into outer darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, they will bow their knee and say, Jesus is Lord. See, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of of the Father. So everything in this world that you do comes down to your heart and your mouth. Comes down to your heart because it's with the heart that you believe and are justified, as the Scripture said. But it's with the mouth that you confess and are saved. So your heart comes to the realization because the Holy Spirit is in your heart. You come to the realization that Jesus is Lord and you can't fight Jesus. He's got all power. He's got all authority. He can do whatever He wants to whenever He wants to. So you come to the realization you just got to yield to Him. You surrender to what we call the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And as you do, it, it makes a change. You're justified and now it changes your actions so that your mouth begins to say, you got to get ready, Jesus is Lord. Now look at what Paul does with the, the confession after this, which brings me to the third portion of my message, which is what I call the five hows. You're going to see five questions that pop up in two verses of Scripture. Five different questions are going to pop up right here. First question is going to say, how will they call on Him? How will they call? Well, this is what's going to happen. They're going to cry out to Him in prayer. Because what what God does is He opens our eyes so that we can see what we couldn't see before. So we know that Jesus Christ really exists. By the grace of God, when you hear scriptures like, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. When you hear scriptures that says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ as our Lord. It begins to open up your mind and unlock truths that you've got to bow your knee to Jesus Christ as Lord or in the end of, uh, in the end of your life, you'll be cast down into the lake of fire where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So how do they call? They call because the Holy Spirit makes them aware of their need to come to Jesus Christ. You know, the text, say, uh, text in John says, no man comes to the Father no man comes to me unless the Father draws him, Jesus is saying. So Jesus calls them and they cry out to Jesus because nobody seeks Jesus without Jesus first calling them. The second question comes up and how are they to believe? How can a person really believe that all this is true? Well, there's only one way that you can believe. And that's if Jesus were to place a brand new heart inside of you. And that's exactly what I was reading in the book of Ezekiel this morning in chapter 36 where the Lord says to Ezekiel, I will put a new heart in them. And when He puts that new heart in you, you come to life and you begin to believe. And because you believe, it changes how you feel. It changes what you do. It changes what you say so that you confess that Jesus is Lord. 
But the next question is, how are they to hear? Now, we, we talked about you hear the Scriptures and you're convicted and you know you need to be saved. Well, how can they hear? How are they going to hear the Scriptures if they, if they don't have the Scriptures in front of them? So the answer to the question comes from the next question. How are they to preach if they are not sent? So, in other words, somebody has got to take the words from the Scripture, from the text, to that person so that they can hear. They've got to take the words that says the way of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The, the, they got to take the passage that says, all of our righteousness is no more than filthy rags in God's presence. They got to take the passage that says, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. They got to take the passage that says, that says God demonstrated his love for us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So some preacher has to get that information to them so that they can hear, so that they can believe, so that they can cry out to God. And then how can they preach if they're not sent? So who is it who's supposed to be preaching? Is it just the preachers? Or is everybody supposed to be preaching? The reality is, is when you come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because your heart has been changed and because you're confessing that Jesus is Lord and you're enlightened, so it's some new truth you've never known before, you can't wait to go and tell somebody what Jesus has done inside of you. You become an ambassador, if you will, for Christ to go and share the gospel with those people you come in contact with. And that's why the, the, uh, write, the, Paul writes in that last question, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news? You see, those feet are the feet that get up off of their seat and go and tell the people that Jesus saves. Oh, how awesome that is. I close out this evening with simply two statements. One is, have you been saved? Matthew 21, 44. We looked at that overhead a few moments ago. Matthew 21, 44. And in that scripture, Matthew 21, 44, you'll remember that it said, and the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. As you sit in your living room, as you look at the computer, or you look at the television set, you, you listen to the words I'm speaking, or as you look at the scriptures that you have in your lap, let me ask you this question. Have you ever been broken? Have you ever come to Jesus Christ and fallen down on Him and seen how all of your righteousness is no more than filthy rags in the presence of God? If you haven't, maybe today is the day that you call out to Him. Maybe today the Holy Spirit is prodding your heart to let you take your old heart out and replace it not with a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh. And that heart of flesh can believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And he was placed in the tomb. And on the third day, he rose from the grave. And 40 days later, he ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father, where he is now Lord, where he makes all the decisions, where he has all the authority. Is he calling out to you this evening? as you listen to this message, is He calling your name? Is He saying something like this to you? Come and follow me. Come, all who are heavy laden. Is the Spirit saying to you, come? Is somebody from the church at Ridgely saying to you, come to know Jesus Christ is your Lord? Well, you could just utter with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, but that doesn't save you. First, there's got to be a new heart that comes into you. But if there's a new heart that's been placed in you and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died and rose, the next step for you is to take action upon that which is in you, which is to confess that Jesus is Lord. Maybe right now you want to bend over and look at the person next to you or whoever invited you over to hear this message tonight and tell them, I want to confess that Jesus is Lord. Let's go ahead and say it right now. Jesus is Lord. And if that's your confession, you're confessing that because your heart has been changed by Almighty God.
Your neighbor, your friend, your family member who has brought you to hear this message tonight is going to share with you at a later date how you can come and be a part of the family of God and how God is going to do a tremendous work in your life. He's going to show you things you've never seen, teach you things that you thought you would never understand. He's going to show you how to come and follow in baptism and be a part of the family of God. It's going to radically change who you are for the good and for the joy you will pursue the Lord because God has begun a good work in you and He's going to be faithful to complete it. And on that day, when you stand before God and God says to you, why should I let you into my heaven? You can look at him and say, because Jesus is my Lord. And you'll make it into heaven, not because of the works that you've done here on earth, but you'll make it into heaven because of the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. Second thing I want to ask is this. Have you been telling people about Jesus? Maybe, maybe you've heard the message today and maybe the thought of a few people popped into your mind. I think the reason those, those names pop in your head is because God places that on your heart. Remember God gave you a new heart and your new heart has the Holy Spirit in it. And God has the power through that new heart to cause you to think about particular people. Maybe he's saying to you, how can they hear without a preacher? Maybe he's telling you to go pick up the telephone and call somebody and tell them what Jesus has done for you. But if there is no preacher, how can they hear? But remember the text afterwards, it says, but how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's time to get up on your feet and go and tell what the Lord has done for you. Lord God in heaven, thank you for the truth of Scripture. Thank you that Jesus Christ is Lord. For those who give their hearts and their lives to you tonight, Lord, I pray that as they pray to you today and tonight, that you would hear their prayer, you would heed their prayer, and you would save them. Lord, maybe tonight they're crying out and saying something to you like this. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to save me from the penalty of my sin. I believe that your son Jesus is Lord. I want to repent of my sins and become who you want me to be. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Good night, and may God richly bless you.
with us over the internet. I do want to encourage you with a few announcements that are uh, going to be hitting you this week. I want to encourage you to still check out our Ridgely Facebook page. That's where you'll find all of our devotions. That's where you'll find all the info that's going to be coming out. Uh, don't miss out on our usual service times, uh, whether that be at uh, 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings or 5.30 at night when we're going through the Book of Romans, or whether you're checking out our, our kids' video that comes out at 10 a.m. every Sunday morning. Just stay tuned to our Ridgely Facebook page. It will help you out greatly. Uh, also, do want to encourage you, uh, if you're still interested in picking up a Stand Firm or a Journey, we just put out the brand new ones, the ones for May. So please stop by anytime, Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 3.30, and we'll run those right out to you. And also, if you want to continue uh, to support the ministry at Ridgely Heights through offering, by all means, drop that off when you come to pick up your Journey or Stand Firm. Or you can use the Tithely app, which can be found on your Google Play or Apple Store. Or you can go to the Ridgely.org page online and use the app there. So don't miss out on that. Also, if you happen to be a graduating senior uh, or you're a graduating college student, we want to celebrate your achievement. So don't miss out on this opportunity. Uh, Brother Dustin's going to be contacting everyone that he knows of that's graduating. But if you are a graduate or you happen to have a regular attender at Ridgely who's graduating, please let Brother Dustin know. You can let him know through his phone number or you can let him know through his email. All that is found in our weekly uh, info that's sent out and it's found on our Ridgely.org page. Page, but go ahead and get in contact because we want to do several short videos involving our graduates so that we can celebrate what God has done and is still doing in their lives. Thank you for being here this morning to worship with us. Rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide. Oh! 